The carver. Knotted wood, dark knots, each beside the other, twisted, intertwining as writhing whorls. The man strikes, rests, strikes more many times, several blows until the arm ceases and lifts no more to strike. And the chips fell to piles lying silent as cluttered to the workshop floor, gathered loose as a rough nest around the square legs of the bench. I watch him, ill-tempered, ill-mannered, coarse cussing and rough, and wonder that no man matched the outcome of his hands. His swiftness steady, the cocked eye, the squinting, and the back step to look askew before the mallet's parting blow, that dexterous knowing that simply carved the complex shapes of life. I recall the man that planed and sawed and chopped and shaved to follow paths ingrained in wood as passages unknown, unseen before he made the way for other tools to follow. And throughout the day and days that came, he travelled unfalteringly a course within the wood he roughed out and lifted the waste in chunks of oak that fell beneath his ever-moving feet. The scuff of his rough boots, clogs kicking, sliding on the wooden floor, that sudden twist, the wrist that quickly flicked, and the wood that sprang unwantedly away in rejected, ejected waste. I saw what crunched beneath two trampling feet and scurried beneath the bench like hiding mice escaping. Then a rose came from within the wood, a leaf, a stem, a thorn, and the gouge gathered haste to scallop anew a petal clear, in a single swift and glancing blow. How could he know if he didn't care but beyond the roughness of his being, those worn hands, broken fingernails, cracked skin, he lifted out a budded rose as an unfurling delicacy. Cursing spanned the days of work and I grew used to it, learned it, used it at times too, but he never used it for his work, I never heard him curse it. It was for his army days that he used it most, that cursing mouth, for the lost years and lost life taken, for politicians far away and bosses that stole more life than they paid for. His family too seemed always to trouble his soul, who seemed always to harry him so, but then he'd lift his hands again and carved away the worries with each stroke he took. By his work, frustration never touched him, for here he controlled all things. And the outcome fixed by his mind came to live through his hands. In this, the wood found motion for the stem and leaf and the bud in the stillness of his presence working. The light from the low windows danced and glanced off the cuts he made, glinting in the winter bright movements of his hands. To catch that flashing light in whispers of a new leaf forming by articulated blows from a mallet made from knotted wood, dark knots each beside the other, twisted, intertwining first to one and then the other, as writhing walls. This is the life of the carver.